Hi, I'm Joe Stiles with Ignited by Truth. At Ignited by Truth, we are bringing to light the truth of the teachings of the Catholic Church and igniting in all hearts a love for the faith. Welcome to the Truth Series. I'm pleased to introduce Father Chris Salar, MIC, Director of the Association of the Marian Helpers at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. Father Alar's presentation is titled, The Truth About the End Times. Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar from the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and it is a joy to be with you and all from the Raleigh Diocese for this Ignited by Truth Conference, where we're continuing to bring you material that hopefully will enrich in your faith and your lives. Well, let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to open our minds and our hearts to receive the grace and knowledge you wish to bestow, and especially that grace that will lead us to eternal life. And through the intercession of Mary and all the saints, especially St. Faustina, we ask that you bless us and this time in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so today I am going to be giving a talk that is a condensed version of an online series that I produced called The Catholic View of the End Times. We're very much aware that this topic generates a lot of um, interest, um, intrigue, but even fear. And so we want to put some of those fears to rest um, and also at the same time make us <clears throat> prepared and ready for what is truly accepted prophecy from the church. All right, so as you saw in the title slide, the topic for today is the Catholic view of the end times. And what I'm going to first do is give you kind of the biblical church teaching along with the catechism. And then we will go into some private revelation um, and some of the saints that have been approved uh, from the church. So let us get started. Now, people might say, Father, why are you messing with private revelation? Private revelation is not required. Yes, this is true. We need to make this point. Private revelation, Thomas Aquinas says, however, although not, yes, required for your salvation, Thomas Aquinas says that it enhances and it is the way God still uses to bring us public revelation and enhance it and gives the people of a certain given time period and place direction on what to do. Uh, Karl Rahner also stressed the importance of private revelation and many others. So knowing what happens or what is prophesized, uh, approved of course, or in the Bible, um, you know, for at the end of our life or the end of the world is important to know God's plan of salvation and for the world. Now there is prophecy in the Bible. This is where people, when they hear me speak on prophecy, like father, what are you, why are you doing all this? Well, the Bible is full of prophecy, especially, you know, the book of revelation, you know, the antichrist, the great apostasy, especially the church in Thessalonians and the coming of the antichrist. This is all scriptural. And that's what we're going to start with today. Um, we know that we are in the end times, uh, because public revelation traditionally we say is ended with the death of the last apostle, but we have no clue how long the end times will last. We could be here on this earth just one more day, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. We don't know. Uh, only the, God says only he knows the time or the hour, the day or the hour. So we don't. And I'm not even going to try to give you an, uh, a guess at where we're at in terms of I think it'll be next year or anything like that. Run away when you hear those kinds of things. What can we do, however, is look at what the Bible and the catechism and the approved saints tell us. And that's what we're going to do today. All right. So let's start with our first slide from the catechism. This is important, a very important paragraph that shows about these end times. Since the ascension, God's plan has entered into its fulfillment. We are already at the last hour. Already the final stage of the world is with us, and the renewal of the world is irrevocably underway. It is even now anticipated in a certain real way, for the church on earth is endowed already with a sanctity that is real but imperfect. Christ's kingdom already manifests. Okay, so that's basically the catechism, right? So Christ's kingdom already basically manifests its presence through miraculous signs 
that attend its proclamation by the church. This is important. The church plays a critical role. All right, but here's the key question. How do we interpret this? How do we interpret the signs of the times? How do we, well, oh, there's calamities, there's earthquakes. Well, Father, those have been going on every year since the beginning of time. Well, yes, this is true, but there's a deeper connection here. And we're going to start with what scripture says. Look at your next slide. These are the five signs of the second coming based on scripture. Um, when I did this the first time, people were writing on, Father, stop scaring people. Well, I, you know, I got to tell you, if the Bible scares some of us, maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, um, these are scriptural. I'm not making these up. Um, these next five signs we're going to tell you are written in the Bible. So let us look at these. Now, the first slide, let's go to the next slide, which is the first stage, or the first sign, is that the gospel will be preached to the whole world. All right, so where does this come from? Matthew 25. This has to happen before the end. Jesus said, we must preach to the whole world and all nations. This also backs the sovereignty of nations. All this talk about dismantling borders and, and having no nations, one world government, that's not biblical. Um, Christ told St. Faustina to pray for her nation. He didn't say pray for the whole European Union. Of course, it didn't exist then. But there is a sovereignty of nations. Now, there must be a penetration of the church into these nations. I do believe that we're getting close to this. Uh, there, uh, with the internet, we're getting responses from people all over the world we never reached before. Uh, the farthest re reaches of, of uh, the South America continent to um, Siberia and even Antarctica. It's amazing. Um, we're getting notifications from people seeing our live streams all over the world. And so we are reaching. I think if we haven't completed this stage, it's well underway. Uh, I know everybody doesn't have internet, but even in the poorest of countries, we seem to find some reach through this technology. All right, the next sign, sign two, again from the Bible, is the great apostasy of the Gentiles. All right. Christ and Paul himself talked about this. Um, Christ talked about it in Matthew 24, which is an amazing chapter called like a mini apocalypse, if you will, where the question is, what will be the sign? And Jesus was asked this question and he answered, take care that no one leads you astray for many will come in my name and lead many others astray. At the end, it talks about there'll be many false teachings and false religions. I always point to, you know, the prosperity gospel that's popular among evangelicals of you love God, you'll get that new car. You love God, you'll get that promotion at work. You'll be the boss. Uh, you'll have riches beyond your wildest dreams. This is not the gospel. Be careful of that stuff. That's what's called the prosperity gospel. Anyway, they could, these people who lead us astray could be bishops, religious, sisters, priests, Catholic politicians especially, right? Even our own family. So we have to be careful here. They will teach incorrect doctrine and lead many away from the church. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2 says that the day of the Lord, or what we call the parousia, will not come until the apostasy comes first. This is interesting. This is a massive fall away from the church, from Catholicism. This will be heresy. I think, again, we're kind of seeing this. All right, let's go to the third sign, the universal co conversion of Jews to Jesus. Let's talk about this. The universal conversion of the Jews, the conversion of all of the Israelite people is scriptural. This is Romans 11:25. Thomas Aquinas comments on this and says that all the Jews will come. And now he does, I believe, say into the church. Um, but anyway, Catechism 674 is important because Peter says Jesus was appointed for the Jewish people and they must receive him before the end. So that's the conversion to Jesus. And Paul again echoes this, that including the Jews into the sacramental life, basically the life of what was known, again, he didn't use the word sacramental or Catholic church, but into that life 
will happen before the second coming and will enable people of God to fully receive him, meaning the Jews. And this is powerful. This has not happened yet. <clears throat> we know that. And so you see the next slide, Pope Benedict, um, one of my favorites, uh, just a quick clip uh, or a, a picture there of Pope Benedict XVI, who is Joseph Ratzinger, uh, basically said that that is why we are not at the end of the world yet, because it cannot happen until the full member of the Gentiles are converted, followed by all of Israel. So he said, basically, that's why we're not completely at this end of the world. So I hope nobody quotes me as saying, Father Chris said we're at the end of the world. No, but we do need to seek Our Lady's help, though, for making this happen, because she's a daughter of Israel. Mary, here next to me, it's just a beautiful statue here of Our Lady. Um, we need to seek Our Lady's help because she belongs to Israel. All right, let's go on. Next, sign four is the revelation of the Antichrist. All right, people think when they hear the Antichrist that this is made up or Father, why are you trying to scare people? Again, sorry, this is biblical. Uh, most theologians and church fathers say that he will appear three and a half years before the end of the world. This is important. It's mentioned in Daniel and in Revelation, it says 42 months, but that's basically three and a half years. There is a seven year preparation for the end of the world. And it is said halfway through it, this antichrist will be revealed. Um, what it says is beasts of the land and the sea, the great dragon, etc. cetera, um, it talks about this. Now, now don't confuse the main antichrist. We've had other antichrist types like Hitler or Nero or Stalin and others. But anyway, um, we see the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians and in John's epistles, because he's called the son of perdition. Again, all scriptural here. He will work deceptive miracles and he will deceive the people and be a leader of this great apostasy that we just talked about. He'll be fully human, remember this. He is not the devil incarnate. The devil does not have the power to become incarnate. Only God does. So he'll be fully human and not the devil. All right. Um, but he will be possessed by the evil one. Some say he'll be Jewish. I don't want to go into detail on that. But anyway, he'll be persuasive and powerful. I mentioned ones like Nero and Caligula and others like Stalin, Mao, Lenin, Hitler. Um, we have persecuted the righteous and were forms of the Antichrist. But this will be the antichrist worse they say than all of the others well anyway he'll have a deep hatred for all the saints and against our faithful so here's the good news all right all this gloom and doom father right the good news is we will be given special graces as his disciples in that time um, and in these last days whatever uh whatever they are the tribulation um, they say that it's important, um, you know, that we stay faithful. So anyway, the catechism also has a statement. Let's look at our next slide, okay? The next couple slides on catechism 675. Before Christ, and if you don't think that the Antichrist is actually church teaching, let's listen to this. This is the catechism. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers, the persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Again, Catechism 675. So that lends credence. Now let's go on to the next one. The fifth sign, the tribulation. Again, very scriptural. So here is sign five, the tribulation that is in our Bible. Now, it'll be both natural, they say, and man-made. Matthew tw chapters 24 and 25 cover this. As I said, it's kind of called the little apocalypse. But anyway, Matthew 24, 9 says that we will be delivered up to tribulation and hatred by all nations for his sake, meaning Jesus. The enemies of the gospel will put us to death in this last time. In the apocalypse, uh, the apostle. Bah, apost apostolic writings, meaning of the apostles and the church fathers, 
We're told that the end of the world will be brought about through a general conflagration, which means fire. Interesting, because our Lord said he wouldn't do it by water, um, but could it happen by fire? I guess our Lord never promised not, right? But we'll get into detail. Don't get scared at this point. Um, <clears throat> which, however, will not annihilate the present creation, but will change its form and appearance. Interesting. There will be famines, earthquakes, wars, and persecutions. This persecution of the righteous, however, which we are now seeing, I think, now more than any time since the first century, will be happening. We are challenged and we have to make a decision. Will I stand for the truth or compromise the truth? Will we, will we really be um, standing for what is right? Because this will be the time of testing. All right, um, this is very, very powerful. Again, he'll pour out many, many graces, and some say that that'll be the time of illumination of conscience. Others say that that came earlier, followed by the days of darkness, and we'll talk more about that. Now remember, speaking of apocalypse, it doesn't mean death and destruction, which almost everybody says. Like they say, you know, uh, Father Chris, um, you know, he didn't get uh, upset when we, we misprinted a bunch of uh, forms and cost a bunch of money. It must be the coming of the apocalypse. <laughs> Because he, he smiled, right, and didn't get upset. Um, I didn't uh, get upset with my cameraman, Giuseppe, when he forgot to push record, right? So it's, it must be the apocalypse, meaning this, this death and destruction. No, apocalypse actually means unveiling. An unveiling for us to see the truth. We shouldn't be afraid. I know this is ironic, but actually excited because all of this is going to bring us closer to Christ, so this is very, very powerful. All right, let's go on to the next slide. But I just started to mention the illumination of conscience and the three days of darkness. Okay, this has been more recently a common topic amongst us Catholics. And what does the church say? All right, first of all, Let's tell you what it is, and then I'll get into more what the church teaches. All right. Personally, and this is just my personal belief, I believe the world is too far gone to be corrected and converted without a direct intervention of God. Um, that's just my personal opinion. I'm allowed to hold that. Um, I think there will have to be some form of an illumination of conscience, and it doesn't mean on a massive scale all at one time, it could be individually. I personally had somewhat of an illumination of conscience where I saw the wrong path that I was on during my life. Um, illumination of conscience is where, what is it? Father, what does that mean? It's where we will see our souls the way God sees us. We, many people, I mean, I had one guy literally come into the confession. God bless him. Heaven's rejoicing that he came in after 25 years of being away from the sacrament. His wife finally talked him in and said, you really need this. And he went in and he said, but father, I don't have any sins. And I said to him, wow, that's pretty impressive. 25 years, you never got upset, impatient, had an impure thought, missed mass ate a little too much at the dinner table, you know, all of a sudden you're seeing that kind of, um, well, uh, okay. You know, there has to be an illumination of conscience and awareness to see our souls the way God sees us. And, you know, uh, let's look at our next slide. Who's this? This is our, our favorite saint, right? Everybody's favorite saint next to the big dogs, like, uh, you know, like the big church fathers, like Aquinas and Augustine is little St. Faustina. And um, St. Faustina, actually experienced a personal illumination of conscience. This is from the diary number 36, the diary of St. Faustina. I'll just read it. Once I was summoned to the judgment seat of God, I stood alone before the Lord. Jesus appeared such as we know him during his passion. After a moment, his wounds disappeared except for five, those in his hands, his feet, and his side. You know, those are the five wounds of Christ. Suddenly, I saw the complete condition of my soul as God sees it. Whoa. I could clearly see all that is displeasing to God, 
Listen to this. This is St. Faustina. I did not know that even the smallest transgressions will have to be accounted for. What a moment. Who can describe it to stand before the thrice holy God? Wow. Diary number 36. Now, some believe that that illumination of conscience will happen prior to what we have heard about the three days of darkness. And I'd like to make some comments about that. All right. Personally, again, I'm going back to my personal content because you do not have to believe in the three days of darkness. Now, let me tell you what it is first, and then I have to tell you what church teaching is on it. All right. Personally, I believe that the quarantine is something that God allowed. He didn't want this. He doesn't want the coronavirus or the death that comes from it. In God's ordained will, he doesn't want pain or suffering, but in his permissive will, he allows it. One of the reasons is to bring a greater good out of it. And the possible greater good is many. Um, you know, we're getting closer to our families. People are watching more on their faith. Um, it's powerful. God can bring a greater good out of worse to terrible evils, right? But personally, I believe the quarantine may be also preparing us in a slight way for the three days of darkness where saints tell us, you know, stay inside and, you know, have your blessed candles. And okay, again, you're not required to believe this, but let me tell you what it is and then tell you what church teaching is. All right. The three days of darkness is basically mentioned. Well, let's start with days of darkness. Let's take out the word three days of darkness is mentioned in the Bible. Exodus 10 even talks about it. It was the ninth plague where darkness covered the land. Actually, I apologize. It does say three days in the book of Exodus. I apologize. It says darkness covered the land and, and all of Egypt for three days. But you know what? The Israelites had light. They were not darkened. The people of God could see. It was the godless that were caught in the darkness. Now, the Israelites had this light. So it shows that God has worked this way in the past. That God has allowed darkness and then a light to the, to the faithful to be shown. This makes sense that if the days of darkness with your candles, it does show that God has used this in the past. This is the Bible. This is Exodus 10. But it's in the past. That's not the prophetic about the coming in the future because if anything, it might be saying, look, God's done it in the past. Be aware it could happen in the future. Could. I underline that. What about Acts 2.20? Let's look at our next slide. Acts of the Apostles 2.20. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. All right. So this is scripture. It talks about darkness, days of darkness. That particular passage didn't say three, but it did talk about days of darkness. Now, it's also in our diary of St. Faustina. And St. Faustina talked about darkness. Again, she doesn't mention three. I'll get to that in a minute. But she talks about the time of darkness. Let's look at our next slide. Our next slide. Write this. Before I come as the just judge, I am coming first as the king of mercy. Before the day of justice arrives, there will be given to the people a sign in the heavens of this sort. All light in the heavens will be extinguished, and there will be great darkness over the whole earth. Then the sign of the cross will be seen in the sky, and from the openings where the hands and feet of the Savior were nailed will come forth great lights, which will light up the earth for a period of time. This will take place shortly before the last day. This is paragraph 83. All right, so the Bible talks about darkness. All right, uh, St. Faustina talks about darkness. Uh, albeit she didn't say three days. That comes from private revelation. But I mentioned it is in Exodus um, for a past event of the plagues of Egypt. Now, what about the saints? Now, what it says in the Bible, we need to believe. That's part of our tradition. But what about the saints? All right, let's look here. In 1820, there was a saint, or I, I should say a blessed, I'm sorry, Elizabeth Conori Mora, who talked about horrible chastisement, quote, when the sky was covered with clouds so dense and dismal that it was impossible to look at them without dismay. 
Then there was a hurricane, a worldwide hurricane that follows, she said, demons will drag away all the wicked while Saints Peter and Paul will protect, quote, all good and true people of God. This is powerful stuff. Now, is this approved though? I got many letters, people saying, Father, how dare you teach that? It's not approved. What you said about blessed Elizabeth, it's not proved. Well, yes, listen to this. Blessed Elizabeth writings were meticulously examined at length, and this is public record, you can get this, at length as a safeguard against doctrinal errors when Pope Blessed Pius IX authorized her cause for canonization. The ecclesia ecclesiastical censor commissioned by the Holy See issued or released his official judgment on November 15, 1900 regarding this saint and her writing specifically also about the three days of darkness. And it said, quote, there is nothing against faith and good customs and no doctrinal innovation, innovation or deviation was found. Wow. Let's go to our next one. Anna Maria Taigi. She's another blessed, which means the church has investigated her. Just the fact that they are made uh, 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 a blessed or a saint is huge testament to the, to the importance of their work and found to be worthy. Let's read what she says. All right. So there shall come over all the earth an intense darkness lasting three days and three nights. Nothing will be visible on, and the air will be laden with pestilence. During this darkness, artificial light will be impossible. Only blessed candles can be lit and will afford illumination. He who out of curiosity opens his window to look out or leaves his house will fall dead on the spot. Now, okay, please. I know I'm going to get letters saying, Father, please don't scare us, but I'm only giving you the words of the saints. I'm not trying to give fear, um, but, but these are words that we do have to look at. You're, you don't, again, have to believe private revelation, even approved private revelation. But let's look what was said about this. There is a book called The Prophets and Our Times by Father R. Gerald Culleton that has extensive content on the three days of darkness and especially the writings of Blessed Anna Maria Taigi, who I just quoted. Listen to this. I found out doing some research that that book, and I ordered the book, I got the book, has the Neil Obstadt and the imprimatur from Bishop Philip Scheer of Monterey, Fresno on November 15th, 1941. While local bishops, yes, have approved this, you don't have to believe it. And it's not equal to being elevated as it should be um, up to the level of public revelation. This is not dogmatically revealed part of our faith that the church says you have to believe it no matter what. And so this is very, very, very important. Um, we also have a situation of other saints. And let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, so we have some other examples like Blessed Mary of Jesus Crucified, who died in 1878. She said, quote, during a darkness lasting three days, the people given to evil will perish so that one-fourth of mankind will survive. Wow, that's interesting. Now, another um, <clears throat> interesting uh, person is Marie Julie Jehenny, who is uh, end of the 19th, early 20th century. And she said, quote, there will come three days of complete darkness. Only blessed candles made of wax will give some light during the horrible darkness. One candle, she said, will last for three days, but they will not give light in the houses of the godless. Nothing will put out the blessed candles, however. All right, so what about these candles? All right, now we at the Marian Fathers, when I gave this talk, had so many requests for people asking Father, 
all right, I realize I don't have to believe this. I realize that the candle is not going to save me. Uh, God saves me. I, you know, we're not talking f false idols here, but God works through sacramentals. And if, if the saints are telling us that these candles will provide light for three days, again, you don't have to believe this. And again, it's not elevated to the level of, of uh, dogmatic revelation. But it is, on some levels, approved by local bishops. Um, and it is secondary, not primary like scripture, but secondary, people still wanted candles. So my next slide is, I want to give everybody the opportunity. We do have uh, candles that are made of wax, as it was said. Um, as you can see on your screen, these candles, um, they're rated for 40 hours, but if you believe the saints, they say one candle will burn the whole three days, no matter the size. And they also said, and, and let's keep that on the screen up there, they also say that um, regarding these candles, that they have to be wax. We've been unable to verify, some people say 100% beeswax, our theologians have combed every corner of, of creation trying to find this. We can't find it. All we can find is that the saints have said it has to be wax. We are in a situation where um, people are asking for these. So we don't want it to appear that we're trying to sell these or make money. No, we're offering them to you. If you can't afford them or you really need them and you don't have the money, we'll send them to you for free in the United States. We'll do our best overseas. There's a little sometimes complications. We have asked for a donation to cover the costs of just suggested of $10, but that is not mandatory. That is not necessity. We are not here to, to, to sell these things. We're just offering them to those who feel that it might provide them some light. But remember, God, Christ is the true light. Okay, Christ and the faith. The most important thing in all of this isn't your number of candles, is that you stay in a state of grace, you, you, you go to mass, and if it's not available, at least live stream in spiritual communion or act of contritions, and pray the rosary and chaplet daily. These are what's most important. Okay, so let's, let's, um, let's try to move on from this because, you know, the candle, many people have said, um, you know, is just a sacramental to help with our faith. But please don't think that's going to save you. That's not the case. But anyway, it happens, they say, at the end of the chastisement and actually as a mercy to stop the suffering that man will be facing. All right. These prophecies, however, I have to stress, are conditional. They depend on man's cooperation with God's grace. The more we pray and repent, the more we can mitigate this stuff. This is very powerful. All right. So let's look at our next slide. How do we then prepare for all of this stuff going on? A chastisement or days of darkness? How do we prepare? The answer is on the bottom of that slide, divine mercy and Mary. That's what we Marian fathers are all about. We Marians in our community are focused on Mary and divine mercy. And if, if you would like to say, well, gee, Father, I want to be protected. I want to know more about mercy. I want to live uh, the spirituality of Mary. I want to live and breathe divine mercy. How can I do that? Again, one more thing I want to show you. There is no charge, but micprayers.com, which is the next slide, if it takes less than 10 seconds. You don't have to, there's no cost or anything like that. But if you want to learn more and get more material and free stuff on Mary and divine mercy and pray with us, um, and we pray for you. It's a beautiful thing. We're called a spiritual benefit society. We are um, given by the Holy See the designation. This is the Association of Marian Helpers. I'm the director um, of being a spiritual benefit society where you can, um, in, in many ways, receive the graces of all our prayers, rosaries, penances, just like you were Miriam priest of the Immaculate Conception. It's a huge amount of free grace. You don't want to miss out on that, in my opinion, since it doesn't cost anything. But please visit micprayers.com. As you see on your screen, it takes less than 10 seconds to sign up, and we'll start uh, uh, giving you our prayers and penances in forms of offerings and praying for you as a member of our association. So thank you, anyway, for that. All right. But as I said, the important thing is Mary and divine mercy. Let's look at our next slide. It starts right there. The divine mercy of God indicated through the face of Jesus, the face of the Father's mercy. 
Divine mercy is the answer to everything. Okay, so what do we see? Divine mercy, Jesus told St. Faustina, is mankind's last hope of salvation. Um, Faustina said mankind, or Jesus told St. Faustina, mankind will not have peace until it turns with trust to his mercy. All right, that's paragraph 699. And Jesus says, if we don't pass through the doors of his just as mercy, we must pass through the doors of his justice. Some of you have heard me talk before. I always say, I don't know about you all, but I'm not making it through the doors of justice. I need the doors of mercy. And so all God would have to do is look at one day in my college fraternity career and down I would go. So the beautiful part is, or the fact is we're here living still in this time of mercy all right now he is giving us this time right now as the time of mercy but he warns us after will come the time of justice so this in this time of mercy we have to understand we need to turn back to him now and one of the greatest ways to do that is to my right his mother he gives us the gift of mary to help do that a beautiful beautiful way to get closer to God. All right, so the next slide, let's talk about Mary, speaking of her. What is the message of today? Mary speaks to us, or I should say God speaks to us through Mary today in places like the slide says, Akita, La Salette, Cabejo, Fatima, and many others. Let's look at some of these. What is the message of these places? Okay. The purpose of the message of all of these are for our modern day. That's what I just said Thomas Aquinas said private revelation is for, to be able to help us in the here and now. But in these places, Mary has warned of chastisement. But again, remember, the future Pope Benedict or, uh, Ratzinger said is not irrevocably set. We can change the future with prayer and penance. We can save souls if we answer the call of Our Lady. All right, let's talk about a couple of these. I mentioned Akita. What was Akita? Akita was a series of miracles and locutions of a lady named Sister Agnes Sasagawa. This was warnings of terrible chastisements, but also the assurance that we can avert and mitigate this chastisement with prayer, especially the rosary penance, and a lot of sacrifices. Now, Akita is a wake-up call. What does it mean for our times? She said, quote, as I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one will have never seen before. Fire, now there we go, back to the scriptures, right? Conflagration. Fire will fall from the sky, will wipe out a great part of humanity. Wait a minute, we just heard that also in the three days of darkness. Only four uh, quarter will still live. Now again, please don't get scared. This can be averted if we do prayer and penance. This can be averted. It says, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor sometimes the faithful. Now this is a little different than some of the other prophecies. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms which will remain for you will be, and, and she goes on, and I guess I don't want to get uh, too much, but will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. Each day recite the prayers of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for the Pope, the bishops, and the priests. Wow. All right. That's scary, Father. Why are you telling us all this? I'm not telling you, Mary is. And this is approved at Akita. So what is the message for our current times? What is the message for today? The message for today has been the same since Fatima and all these other revelations. We need to stop offending God. We need to turn back to prayer, pray the rosary daily to be able to receive the graces, offer penance and sacrifices for souls. This is the common theme. Let's take a look at La Salette. That was another one that was listed. Um, you know, after all of these, this is the words of, of Mother Mary, after all of these will have arrived, many will recognize the hand of God on them. They will convert and do penance for their sins. A great king will go up on the throne and will reign a few years. 
Religion will reflourish and spread all over the world, and there will be a great abundance, the world glad not to be lacking nothing. However, and this is the problem that man has always done, there's a time of good, and then we fall away. Why? Well, in this case, because there'll be a time of prosperity. When do we most need God is usually in times of famine or poverty or war or pestilence. It seems when everything is going well, we don't need God. So a lot of people ask, why does God allow these bad things to happen? Sometimes it's so that we turn back to him because ultimately the salvation of our soul is more important than the physical well-being of our bodies. I know that people will get upset with me for that, but it is the truth. I have to keep focused on the eternal of my soul, even more importantly than the physical short term of my body. And so anyway, what Mary says is lacking nothing, they will then start to fall into disorder, give up God and will be prone to criminal passions. If they do not do penance and they do not cease working on Sunday, remember that was the big message of John V and A, right? Give back to God what is God's. The Lord's day is Sunday. Not just mean, well, I get to go water skiing or fishing, which is what I used to love to do, but it is giving God his due, getting to mass, doing some prayers. And she says, and if they continue to blaspheme the holy name of God, please don't use our Lord's name in vain. It's the second commandment of all the commandments. It's number two. Do not use our Lord's in vain, uh, name in vain. In a word, if the face of the earth does not change, God will be avenged against the people ungrateful and slave to the demon. Again, not to scare you, these are just the words of our blessed mother. It's a wake-up call. La Salette that was. All right, let's go to Cabejo. Cabejo, our lady said, the world conducts itself very badly. The world hastens to its ruin. It will fall into the abyss. In other words, basically it is plunged into innumerable and unrelenting disasters. This is what's being foretold here. Quote, Mary said, the world is rebellious against God. It commits too many sins. It has neither love nor peace. If you do not repent and do not convert your hearts, you notice the pattern here? If you do not pray, you do not repent, then something else will happen. We have an opportunity. She says, if. That means we have a chance to pray and repent and make a difference. If. You do not repent and do not convert your hearts. You will fall into the abyss. On May 15th, 1982, Mary said to her visionaries, especially to Natalie in Cabejo, quote, no one will reach heaven without suffering. Suffering is both a means of compensating for the sins of the world and participating in Jesus and her own Mary's sufferings for the salvation of the world. I've got some talks out on YouTube about suffering. Why would a good and loving God allow it? You can find it on our Divine Mercy YouTube channel. All right, one that's interesting that I'd like to throw on. Look at your next slide. This is Our Lady of Good Success. Very important. You can see her in a beautiful blue dress holding the child Jesus. This is very an interesting one. Okay, what did she say there? Our Lady of Good Success you know what, let's keep it back on the screen while I read the quote so people can just really absorb. Let's put it back up on the screen. I'm gonna keep it up there the whole time I read this quote. Thus, I make it known to you. And this was to an Ecuad a nun in Ecuador in the early 1600s, right? Thus, I make it known to you that shortly after the middle of the 20th century, which is where we're at, the passions will erupt and there will be a total corruption of morals. As for the sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ with his church, it will be attacked and deeply profaned. Freemasonry, which will then be in power, will enact iniquitous laws with the aim of doing away with this sacrament, making it easy for everyone to live in sin and encouraging procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the church. In this supreme moment of need for the church, the one who should speak will fall silent. Okay. Powerful words again. I understand that. 
But man, these are something that we have really seen happening. Did you listen to that? Those were some powerful words that I think nobody could argue that we are seeing and have seen. But there's good news. The good news, let's look at our next slide. At Fatima, we see the tie. I have a whole talk. This is a uh, title slide for one of my talks also online. Mary and Divine Mercy, what we learned at Fatima. Fatima is very, very important in the overall prophecy of mankind. Now our next slide shows why, because we're going to be talking about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. This is very important. This is what we're going to be talking about here for the next few minutes. Okay, so before I go to the next slide, we all know, and I, I, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. I don't have time to explain the whole history of Fatima, but you know the three children and uh, the importance of this message. But I will tie it to something that I also thought was prophetic in nature, and that is the pious tradition of what happened um, in 1884 when Pope Leo, who I personally think is the single greatest pope in the history of the church. I know people are going to be like, Father, you're part of the John Paul II generation. And yes, you can't argue that. But me personally, I just, Pope Leo XIII and John Paul, of course, but is just an amazing, one of the most incredible popes in the history of the church. Well, the story goes that he overheard a conversation between Christ and Satan asking for more time and prayer. So let's look at this slide. Here is a picture of Satan approaching Christ. And this is what Leo XIII overheard after a mass was a conversation between Christ and Satan. Okay, now, what did he say? Satan said, I can bring down your church. And Jesus said, you think so? And he basically said, yes, but I need more time and more power. And Jesus said, how much power? He said, enough to persuade the lukewarm sinner. Those on the fence, I want to be able to get those. And Jesus gave him that power. Why? Because scripture says we must be all tested. And then he said, I need more time. And he said, how much time? And he said, I need about a hundred years. Now, some say that this reign began in 1884. And others say that that reign began, drop ball to, um, you know, the, that the reign began in 1917. I don't have time to go into all of this. But basically, some say that 100 years, because Christ granted him the 100 years, began in 1884. And what happened 100 years later to the day in 1990, I'm sorry, 1984, the Detroit Tigers won the World Series. <laughs> I'm from Detroit. I always have to throw that in there. No, John Paul II consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. If that's when the hundred years were, John Paul ended it with the consecration of Mary. But people still say, well, the world didn't change, Father. It got worse. Okay. That's why some people say that that reign of Satan, he mobilized his troops and began his reign in 1917. Because what was going on then? Awful evils. World War I, the Masonic bankers took their first country in Russia. Margaret Sanger, you ever hear of Planned Parenthood? Margaret Sanger actually, in, in, in just a crazy way, started her um, eugenics and, and her attack. She, she opened the first birth control clinic in New York. All right. But where sin abounds, grace abounds the more. In 1917, that same year all the evil was going on, Pius XII was made a bishop in the Sistine Chapel. Guess when? May 13th, 1917, the same day Mary appeared at Fatima. Pope Benedict the 15th, not 16th, 15th, was doing a novena to Mary, the mother of mercy, for peace. And on the eighth day of that novena, guess what? Mary appeared on May 13th, 1917. So Mary came on that day, which was also the feast of Our Lady of the Eucharist. So you could see God building his army. So we have the tools to fight evil. God gives us these tools, mostly in the sacraments in his church. We don't want to lose them. Use them. Um, so you don't lose that grace. And, and, and in fact, um, you know, Sister Lucia, um, I don't have time to read the whole quote. I, I did show up, but we're going to skip that slide because I'm running out of time. He basically told... 
um, a cardinal told Sister Lucia that the final battle between God and Satan will be over marriage and the family. All right. The last hundred years, we have seen some atrocities. Um, n you know, uh, no-fault divorce, contraception, um, on-demand, abortion, legalized, shattered families, um, open homosexuality, instant access pornography, corruption of higher education, indoctrination of our youth, redefinition of marriage, giant welfare state, test two babies, destruction of the middle class, crippling debt, rejection of our constitution, stripping of our freedoms, especially freedom of religion, um, the embracing of Marxism for crying out loud, um, an acceptance of violence as a form of protest, and a no one is accountable approach yet everyone goes to heaven and there is no hell. This is what's been going on the last hundred years. People say, well, Father, where is their hope? The hope is the coming of the Immaculate Heart. Mary asked the three children for prayer and penance and not to offend God again. This was the message of Fatima. Mary said to pray the rosary every day to obtain peace and the end of the war. So she told us to pray that Russia would be consecrated and then converted to stop these errors. So, and again, I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna try to wrap it up here. So, as we await and pray the complete conversion of Russia and the world with Mary in this time of mercy, we can call down an ocean of graces through divine mercy, such as Divine Mercy Sunday. All right, let's go to the last page. Basically, John Paul II said that's the final message of Fatima, to basically unite Mary and divine mercy. You know, and the way that we can prepare the world for the world, the world for the Lord's final coming through Marian consecration. Here's Mary to my right and things like the grace of divine mercy Sunday. We can get our souls ready for God. This was the way laid out by Jesus through the great prophetic saints of our day today. John Paul II, St. Faustina and others. <clears throat> But people say, Father, Russia was not consecrated. That's why we haven't seen the conversion of Russia yet. Because Mary said, you got to consecrate Russia, then she'll be converted. We haven't seen the conversion, therefore Russia hasn't been consecrated. All right, I want to address that. Has Russia been converted? All right, now, it says first she had to be consecrated. Now, before I show the next slide, I want to ask you a question. First of all, it is not for you and me to worry, or can we change the fact if Russia has been consecrated? That's between God and the Holy Father and the bishops, all right? We can't change that, we can't control that. Now, what we can do, however, is what the second thing Mary asked to have happen before Russia could be converted. Mary just didn't say it had to be consecrated. Mary said Russia has to be consecrated and we must do something else. We the laity. What was that? Put up our next slide. The five first Saturdays. Are we doing this? I don't know too many people who are. So if Russia has not been consecrated, excuse me, if Russia has not been converted, it may not be because she isn't consecrated. She may be consecrated, but it's not happening with the people to do the five first Saturdays devotion. What are they? All right, the five first Saturdays devotion basically says for the five first consecutive five months, the first Saturday of each month, for five consecutive months, on the first Saturday, you go to confession or sometime as soon around that time as possible. You receive Holy Communion in the available mass at that time around the closest to that day as you can pray the rosary, and then meditate on the mysteries of the rosary for an additional 15 minutes. You could do one mystery or multiple mysteries, and that is what we see. The request of Mary to get this done. All right, let's go back to St. Lucy and her quote. What did Lucy say? Let's go back now to the consecration of Russia. I want to address this. Lucy said, quote, he made the consecration in the way in which the Blessed Virgin had wished that it should be made. Afterward, people asked me if it was made in the way that Our Lady wanted, and I replied, yes, from that time it is made, but it was late. This is critical. Okay. All right. And 
Um, so we, we go on and on about whether or not Russia has been consecrated. People say, well, Father, the fact is Russia is spreading her ears. That means it wasn't consecrated. No, our Lord was unhappy. He told Sister Lucy in Spain that the consecration had not been done on time, that it would be done. But, and Lucy even said it would be done, but it would be late. And I don't have time to get into all the examples, but that's what happened. Not long after that Russia was consecrated, according to John Paul II in 1984, the USSR began to collapse. Now people say, well, Father, it still hasn't been consecrated. Well, let's listen to what the church says about this. On June 26, 2000, the church stated, quote, Sister Lucia personally confirmed that this solemn and universal act of consecration corresponded to what Our Lady wished. Yes, it had been done just as Our Lady asked on September, excuse me, March 25th, 1984. Hence, any further discussion or request is without basis. All right, here's the thing. Whether you believe it was consecrated or not, this is not in your control. We can't spend all our time worrying just about that. We have to do what Our Lady said to do at Fatima, and that is to pray, stop offending God, make reparations. This is what's powerful, because Mary said, in the end, my heart, immaculate heart, will triumph. Here's Mary's words. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she shall be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. That also goes into what we read in the biblical signs earlier, that there will be a time that we will see the triumph. Now, it doesn't say in Scripture the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but when we talk about a time of peace, we can see the connection. All right, so pray, she said, very much for the Holy Father. He will do it. This is the words of Mary, just like I said. But it will be late, and Russia will have spread her errors. Nevertheless, the Immaculate Heart of Mary will save Russia, and it will be entrusted to her. We don't know when, we don't know how, but this is the promise of Mary. The message for our times, using all this world and prophecy, is we still have the opportunity to make a difference, to pray and repent and to, to, to do what Our Lady said, stop offending God. And if, I underline, if we do those things, we can make a difference. Now, last comment on this. People said, Father, I still don't believe it's been consecrated, but we talked to the experts from the World Apostolate of Fatima, and we asked them this question, and they said, and this is regarding John Paul II's consecrating it, uh, in, of Russia in 1984 because people say, Father, he never said the word Russia. He consecrated the world. He didn't say Russia. And therefore, it's invalid. Here's what the world apostolate of Fatima said. By the 1984, the consecration had to say, quote, the whole world because the consecration was late and Russia had already spread her errors. So by 1984, not just Russia, but the whole world needed consecrating. Wow. All right, we only got a couple slides left. Let's summarize this. All these messages of Mary, La Salette, Akita, Fatima, Cabejo, all these other places. And I'm sorry, I couldn't get to all of them. People are going to be writing and asking me. I, I know, I'm sorry, I just have limited time here. But basically, what is Mary asking us to do here? Let's look at the next slide. You want to summarize it all and remember only one thing from this whole talk. Here it is. Consecration and living the consecration to Mary. Just basically putting yourself in her hands and letting her lead you to Jesus. It's not to Mary instead of Jesus. It's to Jesus through Mary. That is what we're doing here. And by consecrating, you're letting her be our guide. Remember, you don't climb Mount Everest without a guide. The goal is to get to the summit. Our goal is to get to heaven. We need a guide that's going to help us do that. Yes, Father, we have scripture. We have this in the church, of course. But Mary is walking us through using those resources, helping us. All right. Next, pray the rosary every day. That is the message. Please join us. We Marian fathers are doing a 54-day rosary right now. From August the 15th, the Assumption, to October the 7th, uh, the, the Feast of Our Lady the Rosary. Um, 
Personal, con number three, personal conversion by a daily examination of conscience and frequent confession. Father, I can't get to confession. My church is close. Okay, make us act of contrition. And then when confession becomes physically available, you can return. Four, a Eucharistic life. Get to mass and Eucharistic adoration as much as possible. Five, fasting. Very powerful. Six, accepting your own cross. What does that mean, Father? What you did not choose, what you did not like, and what you cannot change. You want to know what your cross is? There it is. All right, accept it with trust, whatever comes your way, and unite it to the cross of Jesus to defeat Satan and save souls. God bless all of you because that is hard. Now, finally, number seven, lead people to Mary who will then lead them to Jesus. Mary is a gift here. She's not an hindrance to Jesus. She's a guide to get you to Jesus. That's a misconception about all of our brothers and um, non-brothers of, uh, of our Christian faith. Or I'm sorry, non-Catholic brothers, but brothers in our Catholic faith, or <laughs> in our Christian faith. All right, finally, I wanted to show you one last quote. It's in the form of two slides, but I thought it was very powerful. I'd like to put on the screen right now because this summarizes it all. We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of the American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church of the gospel versus the anti-gospel. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is trial which the whole church <clears throat> and the Polish church in particular must take up. That's what he said. I don't think that's on the slide. It is a trial of not only our nation and the church, but in a sense, a test of 2,000 years of culture and Christian civilization with all of its consequences for human dignity, individual rights, human rights, and the rights of nations. Wow. This is amazing. That's a quote from John Paul II regarding the times we're in. And if I can summarize this all, I can tell you simply, be not afraid. Fear is not actually bad. Fear can help turn us back to God, reverential fear. We should be, in a way, in awe before the thought of going before God, which we all will, and our days are getting closer. But what we have seen is a tremendous opportunity for us in the terms of the words of Our Lady and scriptures to say, wake up, turn back to God, stop offending him, pray, do penance, fast. These are things that God is asking us to do, but it gets hard, Father. I'm broken. I'm hugely broken. I'm awfully, you know, just often in, 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 in so many struggles, and you don't understand, Father. Yes, we do. We do understand. And so it's very powerful, very important for us to help you through our prayers. You pray for us. We can get through this. Remember, Mary's words in all these prophecies say the word if. That means we still have a chance to turn back to God and to remain in his loving embrace. Only the most loving of fathers is forced into loving discipline. And Mary and St. Faustina talk about holding back the hand of God through prayers and penance. We can do the same. This is a beautiful message. This is the message of our times. So I thank you very much. May Almighty God bless you and remain with you. And for all of the conference and these future conferences of Ignited by Truth in the Raleigh Diocese, know our prayers are with you from here at the Shrine of Divine Mercy. And for all of you watching, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Alar, and thank you for watching. Please visit our website at ignitedbytruth.org, and you'll find the schedule for the Truth Series, as well as a link to the upcoming presentations. This talk is free. Please share it with others. Donations are gratefully accepted on our website as well. We hope you'll watch the other Truth Series videos available right here for free on the Ignited by Truth YouTube channel. 
Join us on August 29th for Father Donald Calloway's talk titled, The Truth About St. Joseph and Spiritual Warfare.